and welcome to a special episode of The Late Drop presented by Future Fins. Uh, Futures has been a fin that you can trust for years and years. Uh, it's a fin that I use, it's a fin that I trust, and it's a fin that I trusted in the historic swell that we just had at Mavericks. So please support Futures because they support us. Speaking about Mavericks, uh, today's guests, Peter Mel, Grant Twiggy Baker, and Kai Lenny all surfed the historic swell that hit Mavericks uh, just a few days ago. I wanted to get into their minds fresh off the swell. Uh, we talk about preparation. Uh, we talk about equipment, boards, fins. Um, we just talk about everything about that historic special day. I was in the water. I got to witness it all. Um, it's a great podcast, so I hope you guys all enjoy it. I always get the first wave. Pretty much, I it brought me to tears like the wave was so good. That's the biggest drop I've ever taken in my life. And so right there, I told myself I needed to just relax and stay calm that I'm stronger than this. Well, hey guys, thanks for thanks for joining. Uh, obviously, historic day last week, and uh, I wanted to, before it gets buried and forgotten about and life moves on, as in this day and age does, I wanted to try and get a, a swell recap. You know, um, you guys had some of the best performances out there uh, from... I saw it firsthand and uh, also from uh, everyone else in the channel, photographers, videographers. So, uh, so yeah, let's dive in. I mean, um, I think let's start with the, like seeing the swell first. Let's talk about the forecast. Uh, let's talk about what we saw um, and how you guys got there. I'll start with you, Pete, since uh, you're the um, elder. Yeah, the elder, that's a good way to put it, the elder. Thanks. And uh, the most experienced out there. So, what what was it like when you started to see this storm form? And then, was it straight away, you know, just excitement, or as usual, sort of just, hey, let's just wait and see how this thing pans out? Well, I mean, uh, you guys know um, we have a lot of experience in kind of watching maps and watching swells and how they develop. Uh, one of the things that we like to look at when we start seeing these things because they're all forecast, right? Anything is you're seeing any a week out is is a computer model depicting on what it's going to be right it's um gotten better and better in this day and age it's pretty awesome because we can see almost two weeks out we can start to see stuff happening and starting to unfold um you know at a week out you start to kind of understand that there's these maps that show up and i like to look at the days um maps as they kind of unfold because it's important to see the consistency in what the storm is going to do every time it redoes a model if it looks the same you know you feel more confident that it's going to come out that way if you start to see discrepancies in readings or even discrepancies within sites, you know, that you're looking at, you know, we all look at everything. I know, of course I look at Surfline, um, but there's other places to find information out there. So you're always kind of looking at that stuff. And if, as long as it's consistent, you start to get more and more excited. And I think this is one of those storms that we saw. It was very consistently on the maps. It was always going to show that 50 to 60, 65 knot winds, which is always something you want to have is those really high winds. And it was it was there it was there on the maps the whole time so you kind of just build that confidence obviously you got to see it hit the hawaiian islands first you know and you got to see kind of the temperament of the swell there uh and then you know that okay it's kind of did its thing over the dateline it's probably a little bit more focused at california you start to understand that and you go well it's probably going to be pretty darn solid so i mean overall it was a swell that we saw for a long time and it stayed consistent so we knew it was going to be happening yeah, it nearly felt like the, the opposite, right? The first swell was better aimed at Hawaii and that swell as well did the same thing, right? It was super solid and nearly like upgraded a touch, you know, each day instead of downgrading. And then that one hit, obviously, um, I was at Piahi with Kai, uh, Twiggy was surfing the Outer Reefs in Oahu. And then you know, I decided to jump on a plane and get that sideband energy at Maz, which was a lot lower than what it was. But then you saw the one behind it better aimed at, mavericks and also that one was just so solid and it was nearly upgrading every time the model was towards the end it was just like little upgrades little upgrades and you're like holy shit this thing's gonna be real you know and uh so when did for twig and kai because i was i was already in mavericks which was epic it's very rare that you go there and you get three or four days to prepare it's usually coming in on a red eye but for twig and kai um, when did you guys start to go, hey, I'm going to activate and, and get over to Mavs? Um, look, I just arrived in Hawaii um, after a long trip through Europe. And, and, and so I was really didn't want to 
<laughs> jump on a plane and head back, you know, the, the opposite way again. But uh, like Pete said, as every day that we saw the swallow, it became more and more apparent that it was going to be an epic Mavericks day. Um, you know, Pete touched on the swell, but uh, obviously the conditions too is to get those type of conditions um, with light winds, you know, offshore winds um, is very rare. So as, as it kind of drew closer and closer, I was, you know, obviously you, you couldn't ignore it. And I had to jump on a plane. I got there, I think, two days before. So we got to surf the swell here in, in Hawaii. Um, really good swell here on, on, on the North Shore. And then um, I think, yeah, two days before. So we had a bit of time to, to prep, prep equipment and all the rest. So it wasn't too much of a rush, luckily. I would have actually have loved to have uh, got those few days before um, that you had because, you know, with Mavs, I think the first time you, you get out there, the takeoff is so intimidating and so steep that um, it takes a couple of waves to get into it. So even though you guys had it a, a, a bit smaller, it must have really helped you on the big day. And I, I would have liked to have jumped on that as well, but obviously couldn't. Yeah, it, feel, it feels like that with everywhere. The, the first Piahi swell this year as well is just like boom, straight into it, 20, 25 feet. It's just like a summer stuck at home and then all of a sudden it's like into the cauldron, you know, into the dungeon. So, and then Kai, you did you stay for that? For the, the jaws the day before and then did you red eye over or did you just miss the jaws to get over early and prepare well so i wanted to go over as soon as i possibly could for that mav swell the one you went to jamie and um but then i was just like looking at it and i wasn't sure if it was gonna be the day and i was like pretty nervous i ended up not going just because i wanted to maximize my time out of jaws so i put everything into jaws that day and then, you know, I was pretty, I was biting my nails when I saw some photos and it wasn't, it didn't quite hit the same over there. So I was like, okay, I can like actually prepare for the next well. Cause I was already looking at um, Mavericks that next week. Like, okay, if I miss this one, I'll get the next one. And then I was talking with Ian Walsh and we were going back and forth trying to figure out if we wanted to stay and surf here and then red eye over. But I never like red eye doing red eyes into big waves i'd rather just get there the day before get my boards ready and be just fully immersed into like a place like mavericks i mean i think isn't it right that everyone that's ever red eyed that have passed away over there was because of that flight pretty much and i think it's such a short flight you don't even get that good of sleep even if you sleep the whole thing so that's always in my back of my head i'm like if i'm i'm not playing with mavericks that place is so gnarly i want to just you know show up and be totally focused on that and fortunately um, skipping this swell was a good thing because the waves weren't all that good. It was pretty windy and not that big. And um, compared to the swell before, it wasn't very good. So actually it was strange because our flight wasn't until 1030 and I was just standing on the point um, right where I live watching the waves. I'm like, okay, good. It's not that big here. It means that maybe the swell is just focused more over towards California. And like you said before, Jamie, how like it was less focused, um, you know, the first swell to Mavericks. Um, that was good for Jaws, and then it switched. It was like the opposite again. Um, and then, you know, going over to Mavericks, I was just really excited because it had been since 2018 since I got my last session out there. Yeah, that's awesome. So, so like the, like the general public, I think would love to hear about what goes into preparing for a swell like this. And you know, every one of you guys, and a lot of the guys have different ways of doing it different styles and um you know if we start with you pete obviously you live just in santa cruz an hour down the street so you're sort of sort of rancho relaxo i'm guessing but um what's it take for you you know you've got <laughs> now you've got your son that wants to surf um and i saw you had you know anthony your other son out there and you know you just got a new ski and stuff so what's it take for you to you know because you're working in the shop now at freeline so what's it take for you to activate and get ready and be prepared for one of the best days in history well, um, for me, I mean, it's a little simplicity uh, for me, right? I mean, I'm not a quote unquote professional surfer anymore. Um, I'm running a business, so I don't have any, you know, sponsor obligations in a sense. You know, I'm doing it for the pure joy. And uh, this was one of those days that I really wanted to participate in. I think John wanted to participate in. You know, it's interesting, Kai, that that first swell that you were there, that was actually one of John's very first days and first times he's ever been out at Maverick. Actually, it was the offshore day, so it was 2017. But um, that was his first introduction with watching that day. I don't think he wow. participated in it, but um, that was his first kind of vibe. He was actually running 
water patrol. And then there's the day that the boat flipped with, you know, um, that was a big day too, which was in January, yeah. which was a really wild one because that one was just random swell that came out of nowhere and happened to have some weird conditions. But he was there too for that. So he's had some of the best, biggest, wildest days he's already participated in. And he's only been doing it for a couple of years. So he's seen it. Good way to start. <laughs> yeah. He's seen it at its wildest. And, uh, and, you know, so I feel like this is something where he does have the desire, like even yesterday, for an example, like yesterday, there was this thing where, um, you know, it was kind of an average day. Uh, we didn't really have to go up there. There's going to be great waves in town. You know, there was going to be all sorts of th places to do and surf the harbors, you know, enough place that we love surfing and that was going to be good, but he really wanted to go back up there and he was pressuring me to do it. So it's like, he has the desire. It's not something where I'm like going, ah, we're going, you're coming with me. Come on. We're going to coach you into some big ones. You know, this is something where he's kind of very slowly got himself a desire to do it. And that's kind of important to me. I don't want to push my kid into surfing a wave that's as dangerous as Mavericks is. I want him to go and enjoy it and, and want him to do it on his own. Never do I pressure him to go out. Um, you know, so it, it, it was cool because he wants to participate and that drives me, which gives me desire to go up there. And obviously it's for a couple different reasons. You know, you're, you're, giving yourself some safety with the skis, you're giving him some, um, you know, you're able to kind of set up. I mean, it's so nice to have a boat or at least a support crew there because you can have your food and water, warmth, um, you know, you feel safer having someone that's got eyes solely on you. So these are all important things to be able to have success and to be able to actually have the confidence to go do what we do. You know, that day we knew it was gonna be gnarly. You know, I was able to watch the early kind of part of the session because John went out early I kind of viewed it and we going, okay, where do I want to be? Um, I watched Twig's wave, which was a massive one. I knew exactly where that was and I wanted to be on that point. So when I got my turn, I guess, to go out, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. And I knew my equipment was on point because I had a board that I'm very confident in. Um, like I said, the water patrol was there. All you guys are there to inspire me. John's there to inspire me, my both, you know, Anthony as well. So it kind of gave me that drive. It's what's kind of inspired me recently is just this support crew that I have and to be a part of it and be helpful to letting John get, you know, have a safe and uh, good place to have his crew um, so he can surf out there. I mean, similar to what you have with your dad, right, Kai? I mean, yeah, having him out there and having his support crew and having all of the things you need to be confident, to be able to whip it on a, on a 25, 30 footer. And that, that's what to me gave me the confidence to be able to go on those bigger ones. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and cause Twig, you know, Twig, you know, you, you seems the very opposite, like, as in like, you know, you with Washi, um, you know, you like to, I know you like to paddle out a lot, just get the feel for it, twig, and then sort of sometimes less is more, right? Like it's just, you don't have to worry about skis or boats. And, you you know, if you're used to the cold and stuff and you can just paddle out and just do your, do your thing, sometimes that's the simplicity is key. Is that is that the way that you approach this one? Because I, I know you got to ride out with Frank in the morning, but it seemed like one board, just out there ready for the day, just, you know, real, real easy and smooth. Yeah, generally I do like to paddle out. I like to get that warm up um, before I catch my first wave with my, you know, my, my blood boiling and my, my heart racing. Um, but uh, on the very big days, you can expend a lot of energy uh, trying to paddle out on a day like that. So I just actually went down to the dock and um, hope to, 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 to grab a ride and Frank was there. And uh, he didn't have anyone on the ski, so I jumped in with him. And then um, one of the boats was there on the docks, and I actually asked him, "Hey, can I throw my my spare board on?" And <laughs> South so African style. Oh, dude, it's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> How did Bromley do it? Did Bromley do it the some, same way? <laughs> some food and wax. No, uh, Brom Dog's a little bit more organised than me. He's got a, a monster. <laughs> He's kind of got a monster program going, so he he was with them. Um, but yeah, no, I definitely <laughs> Af African did. <laughs> But, um, yeah, I mean, people are so friendly down there and, and, and it's, it seemed like the guys were stoked to have me on their boat. So it, it, it wasn't, um, <laughs> I wasn't being too. <laughs> so, we'll go, so we'll go from South African style to the most prepared guy in big wave surfing, the most organized guy in big wave surfing, Kai. Um, you, I mean, hey, I think we all realize, you know, like you love to do it all and, to have all that equipment, you've got to have all the gear, right? We've seen you set up at Jaws. And then, so what What do you do when you come to Mavs? I'm sure you've got your numbers that you're dialing up. You've got your boat guys and you've got your safety. I know you guys run with um, Jeff, Jeff Kafka, right? You use Jeff Kafka a lot. 
So what's your sort of lead up look like to a day like that at, at Mavs? Well, yeah, for me, it's I really love having um, that support crew uh, and just having making sure that I don't have to focus on anything else except for surfing the waves. Uh, and that way I just don't have to be like, if I break a board, break a leash, I would just hate to be, you know, stuck uh, out there or having to take the time to go in to get another one. So usually bringing more boards than I ever need to use, but kind of my philosophy has always been, if I don't have it, I'll probably need it. So I might as well just bring it. And um, on top of that, on this swell, it was Jeff Kafka is kind of the, one of the guys we call first just because he has the skis and he usually helps line up a boat. We didn't have um, a big boat this time. Um, it was pretty snug, but it was enough just for our boards and, you know, for a filmer or two. Uh, on top of that, it was like I wasn't planning on going on the boat at all. Um, so I just needed enough for maybe a tow board, my backup gun. And, um, you know, my brother actually drove safety as well. And we were lined up with Frank um, uh, doing safety as well. And then Ian Walsh came. So we kind of hooied up and Oops. tried to pool our resources. Oops, yeah. It was nice having a pretty solid crew there. Um, you know, having Frank on board was, I think, really awesome just because he's such a good safety guy out there. And then my brother, who's been getting more and more into big waves, he's a really good safety guy. And he actually towed me into a couple waves in the morning. Nice to have him. And then just going with Ian Walsh, who's also a very um, prepared big wave surfer too. Um, we definitely just knew this was going to be an amazing day. Actually, I didn't know the gravity of how good this day was going to be, which it kind of may be a mistake because if I would have known, I think I might have even brought a few different boards to experiment with. Um, although the equipment I had felt pretty good. Um, but yeah, like I said, it's just to me, it's really important to not have to worry about anything else on land. And it's just me and the wave and maybe battling Twiggy out the back. <laughs> Those are the few things I got to worry about. But uh, um, no, it's, uh, I was just stoked that it all worked out this time and didn't, you know, break any equipment and was able just to surf all day long. Yeah, Actually, you know I what? Like I have one complaint. There's <laughs> one thing that really pissed me off on this swell. I bought 20 bean burritos from Taco Bell and uh, there's, they have the special Verde sauce in the Bay Area. You can't get it anywhere else. And I was so excited to eat it. Everyone on the boat ate all my burritos. And there was a guy, I won't disclose his name, but was handing out burritos to the lineup, which is Dude, fine. I, offered one. There, I heard there were 60 of them. That was the rumor. There I was 20 and I got one burrito. <laughs> and that's why my burrito break was so short. I had 15 minutes. And then next that's thing I know, like dude. all my waters drink, I was like, okay, let's make, I let's make sure, out. let's make sure there's 30 burritos. So we're we take close all the water up here next time. We I had, I had this, we were having this argument in the car when we were at Taco Bell. Cause I'm like, I always get 30 burritos. Cause I know everyone's going to eat them. And I at least want to have two or three. And, and everyone in the car was like, no, no, 20, dude. Why do you need 30? I'm like, it's like five extra dollars. It doesn't matter. So I just went with them. Big mistake. <laughs> got 20, had one burrito. Oh. I was pretty devastated, but it was like the waves were so good. It didn't actually really matter. <laughs> I had a couple of burritos, which is lucky because I didn't bring any food. I didn't bring food. <laughs> I got zero. Hey, uh, oh, Kai, I want to ask you something too, Kai, uh, Kai, again, is that, you know, you like to get out there and on the, on the swells, like, and we all sort of knew that this was a, just going to be a giant paddle swell, like obviously – there was some guys towed in first thing in the morning, but the tow waves were sort of going to be irrelevant anyway. But is is that for you more of just, is that a great way to warm up for you? Like you get a couple of good waves, you feel it, it's sort of less stress level. You just, you just, you get a feel for everything. You kick out, you may have four or five big waves to start and then you jump on your paddle board and you're sort of like, you got a little mojo going. Is that sort of yeah. the main goal on those days, which is, they're basically paddle days, but you get out early, get a few before the crowd, then you know stop the tow session, start paddling. Is that is that how that feels for you? Yeah, absolutely. I just like to get my feet on the board and just feel the waves. I feel like you know with all these spots, you kind of have an idea of how they break. But on this Mav swell, for example, it was breaking in a different place than I have experienced. And you know, I've been going there for a couple of years now, but I haven't. I don't have the experience nearly like you guys do. And so I just wanted to get on the rope first thing just to kind of feel where the wave was breaking. And I noticed we could take off way deeper. So I was kind of cataloging that for paddling because 
you know, I know Mavericks is just, you know, the best big wave paddle wave there probably is because it gives you that amazing chip and it's steep and it's nice and um, smooth in comparison to like, say a place like Jaws or Nazare. And actually funny, I almost didn't bring tow boards this time. I was at the airport, checked in, got a call from Jeff Kafka and he's like, hey, everyone's talking about towing. And I'm just thinking, gosh, like last time I was there, the only reason why we towed was because there was wind and I could not imagine the first giant swell like this in maybe a year or two, um, everyone not, you know, paddling. And he's like, they might tow the whole morning. I'm like, oh my God. So I went on like the one time I maybe wasn't prepared, but luckily I live close enough to the airport. My dad drove down my, my tow board and Ian Walsh's tow board that was at my house and, you know, got it on the plane and took off. And I was glad I did that though, because yeah, like you said, Jamie, it was just a good warm up. So what was everyone's, when we when you first got in the lineup, everyone was out there in the dark. I thought I thought we were early. I got out there, it was like thirty skis in the water in the dark with headlights on. What were, what was um, everyone's first first thoughts? You know, like you we're you're waiting for this swell. You're preparing. You're trying to think of how big it is. You're seeing the buoy readings. What's what's um, at first glance? What's your guys' thoughts? I'll, I'll go on this one just because it was kind of funny because I, I rolled in a little late, to be honest. I was like, I had been on the early, early, and I knew that it was just going to be like, I almost let it kind of unfold a little bit before I got out there. Um, but the very first thing that literally 20 seconds I pulled up, and that was when uh, Luca Padua got that pack, the big, massive one, right? So the li- the lineup was ultra charged, like like you can just, ah, everyone felt it. Everyone was buzzing because of it. It was just so amazing. And like my, my kids saw it. I missed it for whatever reason. I came up literally 10 seconds after it happened. And I was like, just felt the, the energy. So ultimately right there was a straight shock value of just like, boom, here it is. It's charged. It's on today. And that's what happens is, you know, you kind of, it contagiously happens where within the lineup, I mean, you could have eggy lineups, right? And and it feels that way. And it, it kind of has that yucky feeling like people are a little eggy. Well, this one wasn't like that at all. It felt like just straight supercharged. Everyone was stoked. Everyone was ear to ear grins. And that kind of held true all the way through the day. It was kind of amazing. I mean, um, that kind of energy is, is contagious and it actually filters through the lineup. And I think that the performance yeah. elevated because of it. Yeah, it was, um... Yeah, so I, I had the task of towing the young man in, and um, <laughs> and and it was we we sort of waited. And it was like, are oh, we going? Guys are paddling out, uh, and and he goes, I want one. I said, you want one? Okay. I said, well, we're waiting for just we're waiting for one, one and done, sort of basically. And and then that thing came, and he's just like put me deep. I'm like, okay, young man, <laughs> there you go. He and it was crazy. when I. When I, because I, I, I remember taking a really wide berth, because because I, I think Twiggy had just paddled out, and I so I, I whipped him in with a lot of speed and, and took a real wide berth around the back of the surface. And as I'm coming around, everyone's screaming and pointing. I'm like, oh god, what happened? Like now, <laughs> I've killed this poor kid. You know what I mean? Like, and then but everyone's just like clapping. Like Joe, everyone's just clapping and screaming. I'm like, oh my god, what just happened? So I go in and pull him up, get him out. And um, didn't even pull his vest. You know, that's the whole living at Lad's place. He's just like, just, ah. <laughs> and um, go go get go through the, you know, get his ball in the rocks. And I'm like, what just happened? He's like, man, I just packed this thing. We just give each other a big hug. And he was all fired up. And I just got this, like, energy shot, like you said, Pete. And we got out in the channel. And just because it was a, the local kid, you know, the young kid that I think is the most hyped young kid out there and, and it just was like this cr- crazy energy in the channel. And I really think what you said is right. It, it set off for the whole day. It, yeah. That set the tone for the whole day. Then Twig, I mean, Twig they were out basically <laughs> 20 minutes later, maybe had his wave, you know, yeah. and, and it was just, uh, and like you said, Peter, it was one of the most mellow, insane lineups all day long. Yeah, you know, it's basically. I mean, we had a full applause after you ki- kicked out of waves. You literally got charged, not only from riding the wave, but actually everyone else just going, yeah, screaming and clapping and hooting each other on. I mean, one of the best compliments I got was after I kicked out of the wave, Twiggy Law, that was one of the most amazing rides I've ever seen. And I was like, coming from Twig, that's like fucking awesome. <laughs> yeah. So, Twiggy. Yeah. Well, I think it's one of those days where, like, and, and we spoke about, me and Twig spoke about the day because we were surfing the night before when that 24-second interval happened and, and we're sitting out there chatting away and 
And it's one, you know, one of those swells where you're like, well, there's going to be no hassle on tomorrow. Like if you want a big one, you're going to be able to get it. You know, it's just up to you, you know, and, uh, and that's really how it felt. And then for me too, like I, it's, it's one of those days for me where I was like, I was really genuinely stoked to see everyone getting, getting you know, there's other days where you're like, God damn it. I didn't yeah. get one. And that guy's <laughs> getting too many. And let's be honest, your ego gets the better of you. Right. And, uh, yeah. but like seeing you get yours, Pete and Kai and Twig and, and some of the young kids, like I was genuinely so pumped to like sit in the channel and watch everyone get the waves of their lives, you know, and then try and snag a few as well, you know, and I think that it was, I mean, if you could translate the energy and the feeling of that lineup around the world to all the other spots that we go, that would be amazing. Obviously it's not going to happen, but <laughs> you know, we can try, we can try, you know, I think that was, I mean, and add that to the swell, direction you know the the weather like let's talk about how warm the weather was like are you kidding me like the warmest i've ever surfed it on the best day ever the current wasn't pulling us into the pit it was pulling us out of the pit um you know the only thing i can say detrimental was that weird film of foam that was making the wa our wax slippery that yeah. was basically the only thing that like was a negative basically of that day when i try and really break it down and think about it you know Got to so, get the deck pads, you guys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no worries then, huh? <laughs> so let's let's kick off with you, Twig, because you you basically just went out and sent it and set set the tone as well. I think for for me especially, like when I was I was I watched that wave on this ski in the channel, and I was like, holy shit, that was a that was giant, you know, and and that sort of made me like, okay, like I, I'm out there now. And uh, so what what's it like in your head? You know, I know in a couple of interviews, you said you knew that the, the swell was going to be biggest and cleanest early. You know, you wanted to go out there and, 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 and test it like early like that, but you pretty much went out and within 20 minutes, 30 minutes had that one. Yeah, actually when we were puttering out, cause I putted out of the harbor with Kai, I saw that he had his tow board with him and I, I questioned him on it. I was like, um, I think I said, Oh, that, that's not a big wave board. Um, <laughs> And uh, so I was quite surprised that he was, he was going to tow because I thought, you know, it's very rare that Mavericks gives opportunities like that through the full day. Um, and I thought we'd probably have a two or three hour window in the morning to to obviously catch, you know, 25 foot plus Hawaiian wave. Um, so I was a little bit surprised that he had his tow board and I was surprised that the guy started towing. Um, but, um, you know, I had my plan. I wanted to get out first. I, I seem to have a great day if, if I catch the first wave of a session. Um, and also just being out there f first, I, I, I enjoy kind of finding my lineups without other surfers, you know, obviously, you know, clouding your judgment and, and, and interfering with what, what you're doing. So that, that was my plan. Um, I watched the guys get a few toe waves. Um, obviously, super impressive toe surfing around me. I, I also like to try and catch a wave that a tow guy's on. Um, <laughs> I think that looks, that looks pretty cool. You know, it feels cool to get a wave that a tow guy's on. So I was kind of looking at a few of the tow guys' waves, thinking if I could get them. But it definitely, you know, watching the tow guys and what they were doing, helped me find the lineups and, and, and get my marker. And then, yeah, pretty quickly that wave came through. Um, it gave me a chip shot. I was, we, I was actually speaking to Kai. Kai, we were sitting a little bit further inside at first, right? Yeah. And we saw one or two out the back there, and I said, look, you know, we, we, we've got to get out there and, 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 and sit, sit on that peak, and we kind of discussed it together where the best place to sit was, and then, boom, that wave came. And, you know, you get so few opportunities at Mavericks on waves like that when, when that wave came. Um, there was no way that I wasn't going to go, but then, funny enough, throughout the day there were there were there were a few more opportunities or a lot of opportunities like that. So, yeah, it was um, I was stoked to get the day going, and that kind of set me up. Once I'd had that wave, I could really relax into the session, and um, I got two more on the outer on the outer reef, and then I did sit inside for for a while because I wanted to get a few of the double ups on the bowl too. So, you know, through the day I had some some beautiful waves. It was a beautiful day. Just take us through a bit more technically, Twig, that, that takeoff, you know, because when I saw it and you had one similar later in the day where you um, you got up, you went sideways and kicked out the back because there was no entry and, and looked at the start from where I was. I was sitting right, like looking straight from the ski right out and 
you got in and you started 45ing towards the channel straight away. I'm like, oh shit, I think he's going to kick out of this thing. But all of a sudden you went over the mogul, over that little ledge and committed to that thing. So just take us through what it's like mentally to, to commit to that. Because like even as big wave servers looking at that, like, you know, 90% of guys probably would have kicked out the back, but you just, you know, head down and, and committed to going over that ridge and then <laughs> through the bowl. Yeah, look, as I stood up, I thought to myself, oh, shit, I'm too deep, you know, because um, it had a big wall in it. And I could see immediately as I stood up, I was behind the ball and it looked like the ball was going to split um, into two. And that's you don't want to be behind, the, you know, the ball on the takeoff. So um, what I did was I, I actually surfed the top bit of the wave, you know, the 10-foot wave at the top. I just used that to get my speed and get across. And then I was kind of looking over the ledge, looking over to the ledge to see, because there's a definite crease for the bowl um, that you can see coming up the face. And as I saw that crease, I knew that I'd, I'd kind of track far enough and I could just, you know, drop in over the ledge. And luckily it hadn't stood up too much yet and there wasn't a, you know, a full uh, ledge in it. So, yeah, pretty much, I mean, I said to Ian Walsh afterwards, I was like, you know, I was thinking about what I was doing, but, you know, was I conscious of it? It was, it was, you know, afterwards I realized that it was all conscious decisions, but while it was happening, it was all feel and, 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 um, you know, I don't know, experience and whatever you, you want to call it. But, uh, yeah, watching the video afterwards, um, it was, yeah, I mean, it was, it was an unexpected line and, and something that I hadn't done before, but, uh, you know, the wave just kind of, that's, that's how I felt the wave develop on the reef. And that's, that's how I reacted to it. And it's, it's quite amazing, you know, to, after all these years that, uh, you know, you can just react and, and we're doing that stuff on field, but, uh, it's because of the experience and, and, and wave knowledge really at Mavericks. Yeah. I, I remember you, um, hearing you say that that was like a lifetime of, mavericks for that wave you know is that do you is that what you feel like the lifetime of like all those notches and just being out there all those time like all that came into that one wave because that's got to be a, i mean you basically made it you know you got clipped at the end but is that that that's the best wave of your life at mavericks i'm guessing right no for sure i mean it's definitely my biggest um probably my biggest wave i've ever caught which uh you know it's always a personal mi milestone you know when you always want to step up your game and I would say that's the, the tallest wave I've ever caught, and it definitely wasn't a fat one. So that 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 you know, <laughs> so that's all good. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think if I hadn't had the experience and I just stood up and gone straight down that first section, you know, uh, things would have been different. But uh, yeah, I mean, all those years, all those south winds, all those small kind of days with wash washy out there. Um, you know, it's uh, it, it definitely all came together on that wave. Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. I, I, again, I, I saw that thing from the channel, and it's etched in my mind. It's uh, as one of just many amazing waves that day. And and Kai, you know, obviously, you you love to surf all day. You love to get a high uh, high wave, wave count. What was your mindset going into the day? Like once you you know you got your tow waves, you know um, you. Pull the tow board away, grab your big wave gun. It's um are you looking to get the biggest wave that you've ever got at Mavs, or is it just sort of working your way up to it, getting the, getting a ton of waves like you usually do? Like where's your headspace at paddling out on your nine four? Uh I mean for sure. I was kind of riding on the momentum I had from the last Jaws well before, and I felt like I had a you know personal breakthrough out at Jaws, um, just with how I was surfing that wave and just the way I was approaching it and the confidence. And so at Mavericks, I think the hardest part for me of the day was just understanding where the wave was breaking in relation to um, how I've surfed it before. I mean, I'd occasionally seen chip shots from out the back over the years surfing out there, but I'd never seen it consistently. And when I paddled out into the lineup and I was with Twig and I got to watch his wave right there, I was maybe like two feet next to him. Um, you know, he was kind of like, oh, we're going to be sitting on different markers. And that's when we were kind of working our way up. And so I was just, I knew from my tow waves that I, we were going to be surfing somewhere else. But I was like, while it was still that early morning light, I was trying to understand exactly where we were going to be sitting. 
And then, I mean, as soon as Twiggy caught that one wave, I just, I was like, okay, this is the spot. Um, this is where we're going to be today. This is where I want to be because of course I want to get the biggest possible wave I can. And it, I don't think it could get much easier than that out there because normally if you're on the bowl, it's so ledged out that going on those really massive ones is technical. You got to be in the right spot. And this day was technical, but it gave you so many opportunities with the consistently breaking in that spot. And if you were just on the button, you could do two strokes and be into the biggest wave you've ever paddled into. And I saw that Twiggy didn't have to work that hard to get into it. Really, all you had to do is, um, you know, ride the technical part of the wave, like going up high and then dropping back in. And actually, I thought he made that wave from where he was going because he was going so fast once he stood up. But um, for the rest of the day, I just really wanted to play on that outer part of the reef, um, mainly because there wasn't a lot of people. It was just a few of us and there's nothing better than when you can just get a chip into a giant wall. And it just really reminded me of the jaw of jaw sessions um, where you actually are taken off and you're kind of entering into the bowl. And um, Mavericks is, I think a little bit harder to read just cause I don't have that experience, but I learned a lot from this session and um, for sure it's uh, it was one of my favorites out there. Yeah. And, and, and Pete, you, I mean, for me, watching you it was like that that years and years of experience like never reigned so true than for that day for you like you literally you know like i watch you just paddle through the lineup like a shark and just like get get to your spot and then boom in, into a, into a big one and it seemed like every time you paddled, paddled out you just you knew exactly your lineups you knew exactly what wave you were looking for and um you know, was that true? Because you probably surfed, had chances to surf out in that realm more than nearly anyone in the lineup that day. Um, so you, you you specifically had lineups for that that outer ledge, yeah? Yeah, I, I did. Um, you know, it's interesting, though, is that, you know, over the years that I've been surfing out there, uh, we really hadn't, I mean, we've seen it, like, occasionally. Like, I mean, even Kai's mentioning it now, but it seems like, the last few years has been really when we've been able to see that kind of spot kind of come to life. I mean, during some of the tow days, yeah, we're, we're towing from way outside and, and, and pulling through and we're riding those biggest days because we didn't think it was possible, really. Um, we had seen moments that, that you thought maybe you could get out there and get one, um, but not consistently and over the years. And then we finally were able to see the, uh, you know, the first waves get ridden out there. I mean, Twiggy and I, it was 2010, I think was the very first year that anybody really had caught one out there. I mean, you got the, the biggest wave, uh, double XL award that year. Um, we were both surfing that kind of outer realm that we hadn't really been able to get there. So 2010 was really the first time that we saw that was even possible. Uh, that swell was special. So that's like, you think about these swells, they're not, um, happening every year. They're, they're, Heck, it's a decade. Decade, decade apart. And so to get what we've had already, you know, 2010, we were able to do it again, kind of in 2017, although uh, 2018 swell, I think was the last one where we actually maybe a capper out there. I got one out there that day um, that we surfed it. But it, again, there was like maybe one wave for, you know, four waves that broke out there the whole day. So to be able to have the consistency in which we did, and I think a lot of it for that place to kind of start working, it needs to be a more west swell. It likes to grab the top of up there. Because if it's northwest, it actually sweeps down into the bowl. It actually is bigger down lower part of the reef. So the fact that it was mm. kind of west, the direction was right for it. I mean, again, it's just one of those things where just things clicked. We saw it happening. We you know, went out there and, and made it happen. Thankfully, we got to watch Twiggy do it. And I was like, okay, I know my mark. I know where it's the shallow part is. And you got to kind of work for it, too. It wasn't something where you're, you're go, okay, here's your mark, and you sit there. Because as soon as, as a set starts to move, instantly you're getting pulled off of it. You know, you're getting pulled sometimes inside or sometimes you're getting pulled off into the channel. And, you know, it's hard to stay on the button because of the shallowness of the reef. It just kind of feels like if you fall off. But you always are adjusting, right? Even during a set, you're adjusting to try and get in the spot. Um, and I, yeah, I do have a mark. Uh, it's there and, and uh, you know, luckily it, it was very clear so we could see it. And, and the triangulation and the years of experience is, is something that is very, very uh, clear especially if you want to be in the spot and be on that spot. And do you have a, you know, out of those ways that you got, was there, is that one that was the the special one? 
Yeah, I would have to say that the second wave of the session, I mean, I only rode the morning session. I rode, I mean, my gas tank, my battery, right? My battery at 51 years old is a, is not quite the same battery that you have when you get a new phone, you know, like it stays charged for a long time. <laughs> you know? Like you take a beating, you, you, you paddle out, you do, you spend energy, you spend a lot of time. It's like my battery only charges so much and then it doesn't stay as charged. So I gotta, I gotta limit um, my experiences. I definitely don't have the Kyleni battery <laughs> that's out there going all day long. Um, so I, I got to choose in, in my moments. And I think something that's really important, and Twiggy, you mentioned it earlier in this thing, is that um, getting that first wave is so critical. Uh, you know, if you can hook into a wave straight out of the gates, it, it really does set the tone for the rest of the day because all of a sudden you're like, okay, I got, I've got a wave, first of all, so you don't have to stress on worrying about that. Um, so it actually, my very first wave was an important wave because I was able to paddle out. It was a little later in the session or later in the start of the day. So I didn't start right out of the gates, but I went to my mark and within five minutes, I was, I was turning around and going on my first wave and clicked into it, you know, and it was a pretty awesome wave on the outer reef. It was a great wave. I made it to the channel. I kicked out butterflies gone like, Oh, okay. Now I know this is, I know my spot works. Um, I, I know my board's working. I'm back out there again. And sure enough, I went back out there another half an hour. And then the second wave, which was the one that it stood up really tall. Um, it was able to to traverse through the ball. I mean, to to go from that deep and actually time your bottom turn right, because most of the time, if you're getting a wave out there, you're going to have to deal with the main bowl. And if you're not across it, like traversing across it, like Twiggy did on his first wave, or or bottom turning right at the right time to get up into it, and kind of and that wave was just textbook. The wave, everything timed perfectly. I was able to get through it. It did this nice dramatic, you know, double spitter just for you know for for uh, giggles uh but um it just was a really well executed wave um and that at that point i'm just like oh my day is good <laughs> you know, at that point i was just so thankful that i was able to get just two solid waves like that the the set was the one you took was that the double spit one yeah the second wave was the double yeah spit one. yeah, yeah it, it's it a really well ridden wave for me you know that like i said it was the drop in was nice the bottom turn was super cool um you know, the, the double spit at the end, this to kick out in the channel is, is amazing. Yeah. Well, the best wanna... part of, uh, Sorry, yeah, I just wanted to say my perspective of your wave, Pete, was amazing because I knew you'd been like, you'd been waiting out there and this thing just came in and it wasn't just like either, it didn't have that big long wall fang and it didn't just have that like steep pyramid slope. It kind of had something in between. And I'm like, oh, he, he knew this is the one. And when you paddled in, you just got like, it was like almost a like two foot wave was behind you and on the top of it. And then once you got in, then the thing just like bottomed out. And I remember we were all looking in, you could see, you know, you can tell if somebody got a crazy barrel somewhere and you see the back of the wave just doing this. And then we saw one spit and, and then we heard the crowd and we saw another spit and I'm like, oh my God, he just got ride of the year. Like that's <laughs> what I was thinking out the back and everyone was losing their minds and I was just so stoked for you because I just thought, man, that wave he's probably been looking for, you know, forever, as yeah. long as I've been alive. And it's just so cool to see it like cool. right there. And I just wish I had a camera when you're dropping in because you could literally see the fold in the reef at the very bottom. It was like a kink. And I was like, oh, I hope he can like just punch through that and negotiate into it. And obviously you wrote it as good as anyone could ride it. So that was incredible. Yeah. I mean, again, I got lucky. I got to see that one. Um, from the channel as well and before i forget pete i wanted to ask because i you know i've known you for a long time and pretty close and how special was it to have both your sons in the water i mean i i just i get goosebumps thinking about it because i'm like <laughs> that's like to for a day like that to get a wave like that to have your son out there and then and then anthony driving the other ski and and just everything i when i, when I saw you kick out of that wave i'm just like that's like that's the pinnacle. Like that's that's got to be the greatest feeling of of all. So forget about the wave, but your sons like cheering. Everyone's cheering, and they're both seeing that. And and like, wow. I mean, just take us through that because I I nearly start crying because I'm just yeah. like I, I just it's <laughs> like yeah, it's like it's just so rad, man. I I felt the magnitude of it myself, you know. And yeah. I'm wondering if you if that if it was something that you were thinking about or you're so just in tune to try and make the wave and not die but like yeah. maybe kicking out you know it's a, it's the reflection i think of it yeah. you know i mean obviously the preparation that went into it i wanted to include anthony you know out there we'd gone the day before as we saw the swell rise we actually had a really magical moment with just us 
like our sons, my son's out at the day before, right? It was at noon. We're out there. It was super windy. We did this, um, you know, we did a, a big wave meeting. We were trying to meet with everyone just to kind of get everybody on the same page. You know, the big swell was coming. I wanted to get them comfortable out in the, you know, on the skis out there. So we went out at midday the next day and and like that kind of set the tone for the rest of the swell because we were out there and it was magical and it was just us literally just the four of us i mean it was it was anthony and john and i had a guy garen with us on two skis nobody else out there and all of a sudden we started to see and there was like 120 foot or actually ended up you know towing a couple waves and the glassy amazing conditions rode like six or seven waves and that was my kind of warm-up <laughs> so i could actually have some sleep to recharge my battery <laughs> and yeah um, but that really set the tone and I was like, wow, this is going to be pretty cool. You know, that again, the reflection is really where it kind of really hit me, you know, like kicking out in the channel and, and, uh, you know, the, you see when, when guys ride some of the waves of their lives, when you, when they sit in the channel for a second, they, there's this moment of where you're like silently just soaking it in, right. You're, yeah. you're so adrenalized and so high off the, the moment, but then there's this, this reflection of like, I'm safe, I'm in the channel. And that was the best ride of my life and all this work and all this time, all those drives I've made up the coast and turned around and came home and, or it's been South wind or whatever, all those, it's a culmination of that moment. So it's, it's very, very, very cool. Um, yeah. And I, and I would never trade it in like that moment right there, that, that, and to have John just go, dude, that was amazing. Your own son telling you that you, that was yeah. sick, dude, you killed yeah. me. Yeah. It was definitely. A cool yeah. Thing. It, it, it's, I feel like, um, for me too, like momentum, you know, like I, I went, you know, from when I'm, when I'm saying this, I think like what you're saying is you start to sometimes for certain swells, you start to feel something a lot earlier, like when things start to fall into place and sometimes you're fighting things and mm -hmm. things don't feel right. And like, you know, for, from my personal perspective, like I was just like, okay, I'd been to Jaws. I would got myself a couple of nice ways, nothing giant, but you know, I got some confidence back from in, from my own psyche, from what I'd been going through. And then I got to Mavericks, I had a few smaller waves on the earlier day. Then I'm like, oh, well, I'm already here. Like I'm at Luca's house with Sauna in and Surf Kelly Street and this and that. I'm like, oh, I'm feeling pretty good, you know? And then went out the night before and I got a wave the night before. And I was like, and then I just start to just feel like, okay, like, Tomorrow is going to be epic, and I'm 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 am feeling good. Like things are starting to fall into place, and you know, and, and I and hearing you say that, like the, the the night before, just that little toe session and stuff, you start to like. I think even subconsciously, you start to go. You know what? I think it's tomorrow's going to be a good oh. day. You know what <laughs> I mean? Yeah, you want to hope that those things are, are the case. You know, and, and then yesterday was an example where I felt like you know, I surfed it again yesterday, um, and. The timing wasn't right. It was, wasn't great feeling like I got caught inside. I got like a huge one on my head. I was like, okay. So, you know, it's not always rhythm and, and, and is on your side, you know? So yeah. you have those moments where it feels right, you just got to capitalize on it. Yeah. And, and Kai, I know you had so many amazing rides, but does one stand out for you, as, you know, especially? Uh, yeah, I think I, I mean, it's, kind of a blur but i had um i had one wave from the outer peak there and i just remember getting a really good chip shot and i could just hear everyone cheering me on to it um at that point everyone had gotten a wave out there and i was the only one out and that was a pretty cool feeling just like knowing that you didn't really have i didn't really have somebody to like pull energy off of necessarily like get super inspired by when you see other people like jockeying for position and trying to get a big wave um, it gets you fired up. And this alone was um, a cool experience because everyone was still on the ball. I was on the outside and this big set came in and it came straight to me. And there's that like five seconds where you're waiting for it to come to you. You can't really do anything. You're like, can't really paddle towards it. You're just in the spot. So I just waited and I could hear everyone like start cheering from the channel, like, go, go. And I just remember whipping it around and just feeling like I was so in the spot and just sliding into this big wave and then seeing that kink in the bowl again. And as I bottom turned, I could see Grant Washburn with his hands up and he was way down the line. And that was just the best feeling. Cause you know, he's a legend out there and um, he's actually helped me a lot with teaching me about the bowl and teaching me where to surf. So it was a very satisfying moment. Kind of like, I feel like we sort of locked in for a second and then I bottom turned into the pocket and, you know, kind of spat on my back a little bit. And the whole ride, it was probably, that was probably my tallest wave. I, think that was in the morning pretty like it's just as when the sun broke the 
the horizon and was actually in the sky. That wave was pretty, um, was, it was a good sensation. And I would say I really built the rest of the day off of that. Cause all of a sudden that was like, it definitely felt like maybe the biggest wave that I've ever ridden out there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think I saw that one as well. And, and like you said earlier, when you, you were on the button, it looked so effortlessly, you know, like it really looked like someone just went three, four, like gentle strokes and up and into it. And, you know, when you did see people scratching hard, you know, like, you know, for, for like, say a big one, like it sort of felt like, or you looked like they were never going to get it. But yeah. the ones where people just like glided in, you know, it was like, oh, it was just, just, it just showed the positioning that day on that outer reef was, um, was key, you know, to be right on that, that knuckle where it just lifted and just sort of like gave you that little, that push in. Yeah. I think that's what was crazy is I, like you said, if you, if, if I was paddling for wave and I felt like I was really having to work for it, I felt like I was going to be a million miles away. It was going to ledge up underneath me and I wasn't even close, but then there was, that's what makes Mavericks probably the best paddle wave on the planet because I can't think of anywhere else where you could do two to three strokes into a wave and be in the spot and almost feels like you're taking off on a small wave. And the only reason why is just because it stacks up for so long and it gives you that time to like chip in. Um, you know, a place like Jaws is, it's like breathing all the time. The lip is going like this and there's chop. And even if you're in the spot, you're still working hard to get it. Mavs, if you're just, you're either in it or you're not. <laughs> yeah, That's what it feels like, like at Mavericks, slab. even yeah. on the ball. I mean, the slab, the slab type of wave, right? I mean, sometimes yeah. if you're, when you're in the spot of a slab type wave, it literally just, it does it work for you to slide in. That's the yeah. tallest slab in the world, wouldn't you guys say? <laughs> it's like, this place is absurd. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wave that's got the size of jaws, but slabs out like Chopu. <laughs> it's like, it's bizarre. You know, this, you know the, um, for me too, like the, the, the mentally challenging thing that day was like, and, and, I, and I, I reflect, you know, Pete was talking about reflection. You know, you always come in and you start reflecting straight away. I do at least anyway. I was like, like I felt like we could have been deeper. You yeah, know, totally. like, like, you know what I mean? Like, and it was just draw. it was the deeper you went, like, that's what's crazy with Matt. The deeper you went that day, the easier it was. Yeah. Like, but you, you, okay, you're, but you're pulling so far out to like, we're not like, and you're looking around and seeing everyone else where they are. And you're like, this is stupid. Like, this is <laughs> ridiculous. I'm going to take off here. But I mean, Kyle Tierman sort of got one where he ducked under, but I think the, the one thing that I can't wait and, I mean, it would be so amazing to get another swell like that in the next, well, maybe in a month. That would be great, Huey. Yeah. But um, but within the next two years, like a few years to really build off what that was and, okay, that's what we're doing that day. But I feel like, I mean, there was mind surfing ways where I was like, oh, wow, you could get in out there pretty easy. And you're like, oh, wow, you could be in that barrel, you know, like totally. whether you're making it or not. I don't know, but I feel like that's the next realm on a, on a swell like that. Whereas you are getting in so early and even deeper and being able to just set your line and stand in that giant, crazy slab, you know, and I, and I, that was the first thing when I started seeing the waves again, looking back at footage, I was like, wow, we put, everyone was pushing it, but I was like, I think that's the next realm. And what do you think is possible? You think that's possible, Pete? Like from what you've seen, I mean, 2010, the contest guys were, like Dorian the before and then um, you know Twiggy and the guys were pulling in that in, in that day, but uh, was that because it was the northwest stretched out a little more and it was more breaking in the channel? Like I don't know, it just seemed like the opportunity was there on, on that last swell. Yeah, I, I would agree. And then the unfortunate thing I think is that Mavericks as a whole doesn't stay open. You know, not like. Piahi yeah. does, right? Piahi will actually get hollower as it moves down the reef in a way, you know. Um, Mavs, actually, it's all in the centralized center of the bowl. And so it's kind of a, a lucky dip is in regards to which wave is going to stay open or not. Um, you know, there's only been a really a couple waves in, in my eyes that I've witnessed that were uh, ridden um, paddling, at least, you know, like uh, Rusty Long's wave from 2010 in the morning, uh, Shane Dorian's wave from that same morning, where they were rideable big barrels off the main bowl. Um, but generally speaking, the wave is super hollow, but it ends up just funneling off and, and clamping. So you're never really going to be able to go in and out of it, you know, and it's certainly not going to break through <laughs> if you're going to try and punch through the lip. It's just not yeah. possible. 
So it is one of those things where, yeah, we could push it. Yeah, we can and do it. But I mean, you're looking at odds of, of actually truly making the way pretty low. So yeah. um, I, I, I can't wait to see what the future brings. I mean, guys like, like Kai and, and what he does with his equipment. I mean, his equipment looks so much different than anybody else out there at Jaws, at, um, at uh, Mavericks. You know, he, he it's just the forefront of what, you know, we're going to be able to go faster. We're going to be more maneuverable. And uh, maybe that's the case. Maybe we're going to start seeing floaters across the main bowl. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's um, that's a great. I want I want to transition into equipment, Pete. So thank you for that because uh, I think Twee I think Twee's got his bad South African reception. I think he's gone. But um, I know Twee was riding the ten o um, shaped by uh, Paul Nort. Nor- Nor- I'm not sure you pronounce Nor- his last name. Paul Nor- 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 from yeah Nor- South Nor- African. So. He uh, surfed that the day before, so he was on a tenno. And from from my look like for you, Pete, were you on that tenno from Al Merrick, the blue tenno, right? Yes, I was. Same one. So That's been pretty magic for a long time. Hey, he's look. back! Oh, he's back! Yeah, that I little could, nap. I could, took a nap. I could, I could hear you guys the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, Twiggy, we'll, we'll, we'll jump onto you because I know you love your equipment. You're super passionate about it. The day after, you were trying to borrow everyone's boards to surf and try it all out. So, what? So talk us through what you what your thoughts was on that day, why you chose a ten o, not a ten six, or whatever. Take take us through your decision on your ten o. Um, I've ridden ten sixes out there in in the past, and you know if it's capping on the outside peak like it was, then you don't really need the ten six, such a big board, and also you want a little bit more control um, on the waves. So, and then if it's just on the bowl, then I'm riding a nine six. So I, I chose to go for a slightly smaller board. I had my 10.6 on the boat just in case uh, it was more like 2010 where it was a lot more random. It was breaking out there, but it was a lot more random and you needed a bigger board to kind of uh, to cover ground. Uh, we were getting caught inside a lot more in 2010. Um, that was a big thing about this swell was that, uh, you know, there was no wide swing, swinging ones or ones that were breaking further out. Um, which made it also possible to catch a lot more waves um, and ride them successfully. So you didn't really need the 10.6 um, to cover that kind of distance. A lot of the time you're using a bigger board more for in between the waves, not actually to catch the wave or to uh, ride the wave, but to make up ground in between the waves. Um, you know, if you get caught inside or you need to cover ground to, to get onto a wave. Um, so the Tenno felt felt really good. I know a lot of the younger guys were on smaller boards, Lucas and those guys, you know, 9.2s, 9.4s. A little bit difficult to catch uh, the outer realm waves on, on that size board. And I did suggest to those type of those guys, the younger crew, for the next time it breaks out there to get to get a bigger board, a nice big chunky Tenno. Um, but uh, yeah, that that that, that Tenno found great, felt great. It felt like I could catch the wave pretty easy out there. But I mean, car was Kyle, what size board were you on? Nine four. Yeah, I mean, Kyle was on a nine four. Okay, it is. It is obviously um, EPS, so it's got a lot of flotation. I did notice that it's got a lot of lot of volume in that board, but uh, you know, like you said, it's all it's it's all really about positioning at Mavericks. It's a slab. It's all about positioning. You either got it or you, or you don't. So you can ride a smaller board, but Pete and I are a bit older. What size board were you on, Pete? I was on exactly the same. You were ten o. Beef. Yeah, so I mean, a little bit of extra pedal power for me at at this stage of my of my career or my my surfing life is definitely helpful. And I feel like the tenos that we're riding today are a lot more maneuverable and a lot more high performance that, than than we used to ride. So yeah, I mean, it's it, it's a toss up. And I was, I mean, you know, Paul Nodea, I've I've worked for and with Paul for probably 25 years, you know, starting at Billabong and, and now at Vistler and to, to ride a board that he made me in his back garden. I mean, the guy's probably the busiest guy in the world <laughs> and he took the time out to, you know, shape, glass, spray, wow. sand, a board that I got to use out of there. It was, it, uh, I mean, it was, it was really special. And uh, yeah, I mean, your equipment's everything. And if you don't have the right equipment, if you're not feeling super confident in your equipment on a day like that, you're just not going to perform at, at the optimum, and and I'd ridden that board a few times before, but never on a wave like that. So I was pretty stoked to get halfway down and realize the board was working for me. <laughs> and then what 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 fin setup were you using? 
So I use I use thrusters at Mavericks. Um, I feel like at Mavericks we got more than enough speed. Um, you know, you don't need any more speed at Mavericks. It's it's more about control out there. So I, I like the thruster to give you a bit of control. And you know, I was at Ma- I was at Nazare just before I came over, and um, a lot of the guys, all of the guys at Nazare are using thrusters on their on their tow boards. Um, to, to, to surf the biggest waves and, and a lot of them are using my, my, my twig setup. So, um, you know, I feel like when the waves go to that outer realm, that's when those fins of mine come, um, work their best. And, uh, yeah, I mean, for me, it's all about control for guys like Kai and, and, and the young guys. It's, it's obviously more about speed and, and the feeling of being on top of the water. Just correct me if I'm wrong, Kai, but from your windsurfing and kiteboarding and that, they really like to be kind of on top of the water. And when I watch Kai surf on his boards, I mean, he surfs like an ant on acid, you know, just like <laughs> on top of the water and like just, I mean, on the edge of, he's obviously in full control, but he's on, he's on the edge the whole time, you know, his board's on the edge where I think guys like me and Pete, the older guys, we like to be more centered, in the water, use using our rail, um, just a different type of surfing. But I'm, you know, I'm learning from the youngsters. I'm watching what they're doing, and uh, obviously, my equipment is 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 slowly uh, developing and changing with what the, the the young guys are doing. And it's just it's amazing to be there and to just keep the evolution going and, and be amongst it. And and you, Pete, you know, the Tenno, what what fin setup did you have? What what board did you you run that day? So I've I've got a an Almeric Tenno. Um, it's a design that he had from a CAD that was um, very old. Matter of fact, I think Kelly Slater was kind of the first development of it way back when. Um, it's been refined, and especially when I was able to kind of jump on the on the team over there at, at CI, I was able to kind of help develop that the new CAD that they have for it as a Tenno and a 106 CAD. The Tenno, um, like the, the very first board I had out of that family was uh, a, a big beefy tenno that was probably looked too big than anything I'd ever ridden. Cause I look back at some of the boards I have, I mean, I have nine nines and nine sixes and, and those things are just thinner, all thin and narrower nosed. And, and so I, I've obviously had to, as I gotten older, get in love with volume because it does help you to move around the lineup way better. So this one's a pretty beefy tenno. It's set up as a five fin box. I got five fin futures on it. So I've ridden it as a thruster and it works good. And I've also ridden it as a quad. I, uh, Took some notes from the younger crew and watched uh, Kai Lenny fly across the bowl at places like Biahi. And uh, I was able to get a set of his Maui Fin Company templates that are actually fins that you run still to this day. I think, Kai, that um, they're very small, um, very highly technical foiled, um, meant to go really, really fast. And I've got this kind of old school design with these new fins on it that uh, are amazing. I mean, I, I've, I've, run, I've had those set now for a couple of years now, ridden them in all types of waves. And so it's like a, a, a nice V bottom quad set up this day, just because I felt like the speed was going to be a key element. And I felt comfortable on that board no matter what. So I didn't want to change much. I have ridden it as a thruster, but I think the best part was is going fast. At least I wanted to go fast that day. And uh, that was uh, kind of it. I took a little bit of the old school and a little bit of the new school and implemented it for me and, and it worked out. Yeah. Awesome. And, and Kai, I, I mean, you know, if we're talking equipment, you've probably dialed in, you know, as, as much as anyone, it seems like you're, you've, you've taken um, your paddle boarding experience. This from just from my personal, um, what, what I'm saying, it seems like you've taken like the windsurfing and maybe the paddle boarding, the stand up and sort of merged that into what you've wanted to do with your with your paddle boards and you know especially even the construction and stuff like that so so you were riding a nine four um and tell us about that yeah so i was riding a nine four it's definitely i would say it's thicker and it's pretty thick and wide and i like that just because i want to be able to um when i'm paddling be able to punch through any chop ahead and in most recent times like um, we've been working on developing the boards, so e- they're even a little more aerodynamic in the front end, and it's, that's pretty exciting. Um, especially like being able to utilize the nose as downforce, kind of like a Formula One car would with a front wing, instead of having that thing pick up, you know, air and want to fly away. Been trying to figure out how to make them fly, and you know, coming from Maui or it's windy all the time. Um, it's a perfect place to develop that. And we kind of had to, or I feel like I had to. And so I've been working with my shaper, Keith Tabool here, 
And we're making them so that when you do get into a big airdrop, they'll hover underneath your feet and stay completely stable. When you land, they won't stop, but they'll just kind of accelerate. And a lot of that has come from the windsurfing design. This board has many windsurfing elements. I think the way I'm able to maneuver them because they're a little bit wider and pretty thick is based on my experience stand up paddling, just getting used to these giant boards, which are much bigger than even these. So when I hop on these, they don't even feel that big. And you know, I'm running full traction pad just because I know if I stay out nine, 10 hours, that's not going to change. Um, I don't need to rewax it. And I just, I'm so used to it from kind of my other sporting backgrounds. Um, all my boards are carbon fiber. Um, they're layered in a certain way. So depending on conditions, I have some that flex slightly different. And yeah, they're all epoxy as well. And I do love that feeling of skipping across the water. I'm just really used to it. I'd rather go as fast as possible and try to lose speed than try to have to pick speed up. Um, that is kind of always been my approach. And then those fins that Pete's using and I'm still using today, uh, they're very much you know, speed oriented and come from windsurfing where the front fin is slightly smaller than the back. The back fin has more rake. The front one is pretty vertical. and that's just to be able to handle speed. And I feel like for me, those fins um, are in between a traditional quad and maybe a thruster. They kind of have that a little bit more of a role to it than most quads have. Um, however, they have the speed of the quads and, you know, coming from jaws, it's all about going as fast as you can down the line. And um, you know, the way I kick myself in the butt, if I was kind of in front of a wave, I would just say, gosh, I can go so fast. I should just go deeper. So it's like, kind of like the equipment's forcing me to go deeper <laughs> and I have complete faith that if I go to the air, I can land it. Um, and if I don't, then it was probably my fault because my gear is working pretty good, but there's a lot going on and you know, I'm really trying to develop it as much as possible. So what, like when you say thicker and wider, like how much more than say you say when you were you're surfing those say traditional boards, like what's the, what's the thickness for you? Cause you only, you only weigh like one fifty five or something. Yeah, you know, yeah, I'm like, I fluctuate between 150, 155. And I mean, maybe comparing to other boards, it's not as thick or as wide. But I think for my size, um, I go 21 and a quarter wide. Um, it's pretty full through the entire thing, nose mm -hmm. to tail. It is foiled, of course, but actually a lot thicker in the nose just to kind of punch through chop and get that aerodynamic benefit, um, surprisingly. And then you also, well, I also have, um, I would say my volumes are probably four inches, maybe a little bit more. And we do this crazy concave deck. So my heels and my, my heel and my toes are actually lower than the center, but the rails are still thicker. And I really prefer a thicker rail. Um, and I actually have the, uh, the release point on the rail way forward. It's kind of a windsurfing rail where it's tucked, but it has an edge. And that's just so you, I can trim it to a certain angle and I could get all the speed. But once I engage really over, the rail sucks to the water and I can just plow through chop like nothing um, and not skip out. And those fins were kind of designed in, in with that in mind. So I could be way forward on the board. I think sometimes when I look at the photos and video of me riding, the boards look way shorter. And it's because I'm usually just standing halfway up, um, almost in the front of my deck pad. Uh, and that's just... That's just a windsurfing style because you're used to being really forward on the rails. Yeah, it's amazing how um, living in one of the windiest places on earth can uh, expand your mind to, to, for, for some new design. Yeah, I mean, you're kind of forced to around here. <laughs> so you change it up like from what from what you would write at Jaws to uh, Mavs, uh, to two different, the same sort of, you know, um, outline and stuff, but maybe just different weights and stuff. Yeah, you know, the nine fours that I rode this time, um, same ones at Jaws, but you know, I'm finding the water is a lot denser over there because it's colder. I could really feel that when I try to push onto my boards there, I can't quite engage it like I can in Hawaii. And so I'm thinking actually going a lot thinner for Mavericks um, because if I just take off in the right spot, I'm gonna be in it. Um, and it might not even be thicker or thinner uh, forward, it just will be towards the tail. Um, just see some of these photos where I'm almost like hydrofoiling down a wave. I'm like so on top of the water. And I and I realize that the water hits really hard there because when you fall, you definitely bounce and skip way farther. You can't like penetrate, especially with all that rubber on. Interesting. Yeah, it's incredible. So what so guys, all in all, I mean, 
an incredible day. Like any other things out there that you guys saw, anyone else, you know, any other kids that impressed you guys that you saw, like, you know, that you, you saw yourself, like, you know, right there in the channel, like who was, who was impressing you guys? Elder? Pete? Pete? Well, I'd have to say, I mean, I, I, I can take two, two of the kids that I think are, are really stepping up. It's going to be my son, John, and his approach. I think they're, and then you got to look at Luca Padua, you know, um, right there from El Granada. He lives there. You can pretty much see the break from his house. So um, he is obviously taking his training to a level beyond that um, anyone is at. He's been parked at, at Laird's house. He's been doing the pool training which is just, a, you know, he has that mentality that he is going to have the most physical and perfect element body to deal with anything that Mavericks has to deal with you. Um, you know, so I, and, he, and he takes this, you know, I'm going no matter what kind of attitude, you know, and, and that he knows in his mind that he's going to be able to deal with the punishment that yeah, maybe pushing the envelope can do. Whereas John's kind of been a little bit opposite. He takes a much more kind of calculated approach in the way that he he surfs out there. He doesn't push the envelope too much right out of the gates. He's just going to kind of ease his way into it. Um, so, I mean, they're they're both ways that are going to be successful to surf the place. So I, I really like to see John and the way he's been kind of building himself up to being one of the guys out there. And then also the way Luca does. They're both totally different ways to get to that point, but they're both ways that work. Yeah. Yeah, I saw that. Um, I saw Allo. Um how do you yep. pronounce his last name, Pete Siva? I saw him get right, a couple well, of great waves, and um, you know, it impresses me too. Is um, is Willem? Willem Banks got he, he wasn't out the back, but he got a couple of really sick ones on the bowl, air drop, rode through the like the, the push, the white water, kicking out. So I, I saw him get a you know, and, and it's too like when you're in the water or on the channel. I spent a bit of time in the in the channel, so I got to see a lot of guys get waves. But I saw him get a couple of really really nice rides as well. But what about you, Twiggy, from your point of view? Obviously, you know, you, you three, uh, Jojo Roper got a bomb too. That, that d thick double up one. Um, Jojo got a bomb, but, um, Twiggy, any, anyone that was impressing you apart from you guys? Obviously, yourself. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I obviously, I haven't commented or commented on, uh, Pete's wave yet, but I saw that thing clean from the channel, from the boat. Um, and like, you know, like I said on the day, I think that's the best wave I've ever seen at Mavericks. Um, and then Willem Banks, I saw his one too, um, epic airdrop to, uh, you know, squeezing around, around the foam. I thought that was the second best wave that I saw. Um, and, uh, I saw uh, Matt Becker have a few yeah, really, Matt. really good waves. Um, and then, uh, I think Ian Walsh, um, had, had one behind the crease where I was watching him paddle into it and I didn't realize that it was Ian and I was like, well, you know, that guy's never going to make it from there. And then I, I was commentating on the boat. I was like, oh, that guy's done. And then I said, oh, it's Ian, it's Ian. And he kind of took off behind the ledge on a double up, came around. And that was the way that you guys were talking about earlier where he was set up for the barrel. And unfortunately, um, a guy flew out the lip and, and, and landed on top of him. But uh, um, Ian really uh, you know, he really impressed me as, as somebody who hasn't surfed out there that much, but you know, what a talent in big waves. And you could really tell on that day. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I saw that wave from the channel as well with, um, with Ian and it was, I was so focused on him. He made the airdrop and I was like, if he didn't make that, he was in a bad spot, <laughs> but he pulled that thing. I mean, such a talented surfer that to make that. And then as he's just, looking for his line, he sees a guy flying out of the air and he had to jump off his board right in the bowl. It was like a horrific wipeout. But um, you, Kai, from what you saw, um, anyone uh, impressing you out there? Oh, uh, no, I feel like you guys highlighted, um, you know, most of the crew. Um, and, you know, I, I was really impressed with, um, you know, the consistency that a lot of guys brought throughout the day. You know, it was a long day and, um, you know, as people went in, got some food and came back out, it was just cool to see like they weren't, people weren't just letting waves go by. Like if they were in the spot, it was, people were rushing um, immediately, uh, you know, all the way till dark. Uh, and um, I think I saw a really good one of you, Jamie, late in the evening. Um, that was really cool. You were um, on the outer bowl or outside of the bowl. And it was like not quite as deep as where we were, but you had that crazy little chip in. And that way was really impressive to see like, probably could barely see dropping into that. It was pretty dark. And then of course, you know, 
with wall sheets and, you know, Willem Banks, Luca, John, um, you know, it's just really cool. I, what I love about the new generation just reminds me of when I was there, you know, not that long ago. And, you know, you're just trying to figure it out. Um, experience really does make all the difference in big wave surfing. And I've come to learn that immensely just because you know what you want when you go out there now, um, or at least when I go out there, I know exactly what I want now. Um, you tend to make a lot less mistakes because you're not just like getting frustrated and hucking yourself. Um, and it's just, you're, I'm seeing the path of a lot of these young guys as they go through it. And it's just like, just reminds me of when I was in their position and um, how terrifying yet how much fun is that when you get back and you're just buzzing and your endorphins are popping out. It's uh, yeah, it's, it's big wave surfing is probably the coolest sport in the world because if you want to be truly one of the greats, like your guy, like you guys, um, it you know you're in for the long haul. It's not like a two year, three year thing. It's like okay, in thirty years, I'll maybe start <laughs> feeling really comfortable. <laughs> well, you know, you know, what's so cool is like you know, speaking to you guys right now. It's like you, you know, you, me and Twigger are around the same age, and then you got Pete who's fifty one. So like, I'm thinking, okay, Pete's if Pete if that swell comes again in three or four years time. Pete's probably going to be out there, right? He's going to be 55. I'm 44. I'm like, okay, that's 10 years. I've got another 10 year window to get another chance at a swell like that. So that makes me feel good. And Twiggy, well, you're just an animal too, Twiggy. I love that, you know, we're some of the oldest guys out there and still able to like, you know, performance might be quite there, but, but, but to be out there and rub shoulders and still be getting the gnarly, like you getting the gnarly, like the Jaws wave and that wave, like that's inspiring, Brew. I mean, it really is. And then obviously Kai, you know, like the, the, you know, the, the up and coming, the superstar and just like the performance. And you've got this generation gaps that you can, that you can feed off. And, you know, like I fed off all you guys. I fed off Luca first thing in the morning that I fed off. Twiggy seen that wave and then then you saw Kai get his wave. I saw Pete and I was like, oh my God. Like even in the afternoon when the wind came up, Pete just took that late drop and just stood there like it was like a two foot day at the lane and just got exploded. And I'm like, God damn it, I gotta go back out now. You know what I mean? Like and I just like fired me up. And like when I really look back at it, like that may be the best day I've ever had on the water. Like just I would as agree. an overall the the like take away everything that happened, but just the vibe and the feeling, and you. And, and the other thing that we, Kai was talking about earlier too, was like how rare is it to be able to be out 150 yards off the bowl and hearing people yelling to go. Yeah, like you know what I mean. Like you ain't hearing shit at Jaws. All you're seeing is water in your eyes and fucking wind and helicopters and whatever it is, you know. But there, it's just like you could hear people screaming the sets and you could hear people screaming to go, and then. As you're kicking out, you could hear the people screaming when they, when people were kicking out from a ride. And I don't know, like when you talk about reflection, Pete, you know, reflecting now, you just go, man, like it does not get much better than that day, like in just so many ways. It's true. Well, like like we said, camaraderie and respect are the cornerstones of big wave surfing and long may that last. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, for sure. So final words, guys. Um, I've kept you too long. Who got the best wave, guys? I want to put you guys on the spot right now. Who's who, if, if 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 everything finished and we had to pick right of the year? Who who got right of the year from the swell? It was definitely. I'd say definitely Pete. I would say Pete's wave, and then I think Twiggy, you got the tallest wave ever, world record, baby. <laughs> And then, yeah, tallest wave was, you know, it was funny. Like when I saw Twig post yours the next morning, I woke up, like, and I was like, fuck, look at that thing. You know, like I was just like <laughs> in bed, like looking at it. And then, you know, you go to the toilet, you have something to eat, you come back, you look at it again. And, you know, you know and, then, and then all of a sudden Pete's pops up. I'm like, hey, hang on a minute. There's a contender here as well. And then you see Kai and you're just like, holy shit, like, like real, like the beauty of, um, everyone's different opinions, dissecting them. And then um, I think another big thing that I'm going to try work on this year is the judging of the height, you know, really dialing in with some, with technology, like more than just getting a ruler out and, you know, however it's been done, you know, I think that's one thing we owe it to ourselves. You know, we owe it to everyone is, so how do we really judge a wave and how do we really get the height, you know, because it's so subjective, but, Either way, 
you guys are in the running. The year's not over. Um, and, uh, yeah, you guys, um, thank you for inspiring everyone, myself. Hey, we, we all caught 30-foot Hawaiian waves. <laughs> That's a rare, rare yeah, able to do that. Yeah. So, um, all right, guys, well, you. thanks for being on the late drop. Um, special yeah. swell edition. And, um, yeah, I hope everyone enjoys the talk, and I'll talk to you guys soon. Thanks, Jamie, for putting thanks, us together. Thanks, Surfline, for having this platform. Yeah, thank you.